God has a message for you. Matter of fact, God has a lot of messages for you. And he uses different ways to communicate them. For one way, he wrote a book called the Bible, and he filled it with stories. Now, those stories have to do with other people at another time. But he put those stories in his book to tell us something. Matter of fact, Paul says in Romans chapter 15 that those stories in the Old Testament were written for our learning. So there's a sense in which you could say those stories were written to them, but for us. The illustration I've often used is when you're speeding down the freeway and a patrolman has pulled over someone else and writing them a ticket, the ticket is for them, but it's to me to slow down. Now, that's the way it is with those stories in the Old Testament. What I want to do today is uh, tell you three short stories. They're all in one chapter of 2 Kings. They're messages to three different people, but what God told them is for us, according to Paul in Romans 15, verse 4. So turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 8. And let's look at a couple of stories where God had a message for them that applies to us. The first has to do with a message he had for the king in... Uh, uh, and I'm sorry, we get to the king of me. At first, he has to do with a woman that we've met before in Kings. At any rate, look at verse 1. Then Elisha spoke to the woman whose son had restored to life, saying, Arise and go, you and your household, and stay wherever you can. For the Lord has called for a famine, and furthermore, it will come upon the land for seven years. Now, the first message in this passage is to a woman who is not identified by name. She's identified by saying that uh, this was the same woman who was re whose son was restored to life. Now, if you've been tracking me as we've been going through 2 Kings, you'll remember that story. There was this woman that uh, Elijah stayed with her and her husband and she decided to build a special room just for him and then Elisha had a message for her that she would have a son perhaps she had some daughters we don't know but she had never had a son and sure enough she had a son and then several years later the son dies and Elisha restores that son to life now, the reason I'm bringing that up is that that woman had an experience that taught her to trust the Lord. The Lord had a message for her, you're going to have a son. And then lo and behold, the son dies and she goes straight to Elisha knowing that God could restore the son. And God did. Now, in this case, uh, God has a message for her. It's really interesting uh, the passage tells us there's going to be a famine. It's going to last for seven years, and the Lord caused it. Now, we know from other passages of Scripture that the cause of this famine was the sin of Israel. They were getting into idolatry, and the Lord wanted to get their attention, and one of the things he used was famine. But what is interesting is he sends... Elisha to tell her to leave town. So you could say the one point of this story is God has a message for you. There's a famine coming and he has a message for you as to what to do about it. Listen to this man of God that I sent you and leave town. In other words, do what I'm telling you to do. So, verse 1 in 2 Kings 8 is simply saying God had a message for that woman. And it boils down to this. Trouble is coming. Do what 
I'm telling you to do through the man of God called Elisha. So what happens? Well, look at verse 2. And the woman arose and did according to the saying of the man of God. And she went with her household and dwelt in the land of the Philistines seven years. Now, if there was a famine, uh, Philista was part of the land. I mean, if there was a famine, I mean, going there wouldn't solve it, would it? Well, apparently it would. As I mentioned a minute ago, the famine was against Israel. And technically, Felicia was a little ways in a separate sort of a land. And apparently, the famine didn't affect them. So she literally left the country and went and spent seven years among the Philistines. And it came to pass, verse 3, at the end of seven years that the woman returned to the, from the land of the Philistines and she went to make an appeal to the king for her house and her land. Now she left the land and no longer possessed it. So what happened? Well, the text doesn't tell us. Perhaps she sold it and she's appealing to the king to let her have it back. According to the Mosaic law, that had to happen. God had given portions of the land to the different tribes and within those tribes to different families. And God instructed Moses to tell the children of Israel that they were to uh, see to it that those families had the land. So even though she might have sold it after so many years, the law said it had to be returned to her. So maybe she's going to the king for that reason. Another possibility is that whatever happened to the land, the king was uh, keeping it for safekeeping, so to speak. So she's just going back to him saying, it belongs to my family and therefore it belongs to me. Then the king, according to verse 4, talked to Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me, please, all the great things that Elisha has done. Now, you remember this fellow. He's the guy that had leprosy. Remember that? Matter of fact, in a previous passage, he had leprosy and he died. Well, that means that this story is not in chronological order. That's all that means, that this story took place before he had leprosy. At any rate, it says, now, it happened as he was telling the king how he had restored, that is, Elisha had restored the dead to life, that there was the woman whose son had been restored to life, appealing to the king for her house and her land. And the servant said, my Lord, this is the woman. This is her son who Elisha restored to life. Interesting. At the moment, the servant was telling the king all that Elisha had done. The woman appears at a very appropriate time. As a matter of fact, uh, one author called it a very propitious moment. She just happened to appear. It was perfect timing. Now, uh, we're at the end of this first little episode. Uh, the story goes on to say that when the king asked the woman, he told her. So the king appointed a certain officer for her saying, restore all that was hers and all the proceeds of the field from the day that she left the land until now. So very simply, uh, he ordered that all the land be restored and all the proceeds from the land for seven years. So she got her land back plus interest. Interesting. She was completely restored. Now, the point it seems to me is very simple. Uh, God deliberately chose this woman of all people to tell her to get out of Dodge. Now, 
she was a woman of faith, as I pointed out. She had already trusted the Lord for that crisis in her life. So you could say that this, the Lord has a message for believers. And in her case, it was that there's a famine coming. Now, as I said, that story was written to her for us. So what's the message for us? Answer, is there a famine coming? Inflation, maybe. What's the message for us? Here it is. The principle. Trouble's coming. I hate to be the one to tell you this. But if you've lived any time at all, you know life consists of trouble. Matter of fact, the Bible is very clear about that. The book of Job says, Yet man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Job 5, 7. And in 14, 1, it says, Man who is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. And all the old people said, Amen. Now, uh, you have any trouble lately? That's life. Matter of fact, some of you shook your head immediately. You had any trouble? If you had any trouble in the last week, you've had it in the last month, and everybody shook their head, you know? I'm going to tell you what trouble's going on in your life. Within three guesses, I can tell you the, the nature of the trouble you are having or have had recently and will have in the future. You ready for this? And by the way, if I don't, if I don't get yours within three, I want you to tell me afterwards because I think, I think these three things cover it, all right? Number one, you've had trouble with a relationship. People are raising their hands already. <laughs> All right, number two, if it isn't a relationship, it's um, money. <laughs> I see. Boy, I've never had so many people raise their hands spontaneously in the middle of a sermon. Right. All right, let me give you a third one. You ready? Health. Some of the same people are raising their hands again. Does that cover it? Yeah. Now, some of you are going to say, yeah, but you didn't talk about repairing the car and repairing uh, the car or replacing the washing machine. Well, those are all financial issues, right? So all those specific things you can list probably come under one of those things. Now, the point I'm making is God has a message for you. And the message clearly stated is, there's trouble coming. But there's a second message embedded in that one. And that is, trouble is coming, and I'm going to tell you what to do about it. In this lady's case, God sent a messenger to her to say, a famine is coming, and you need to do what I say, which in your case means, get out of town. And she did it. Now, it seems to me, this is so incredibly simple, but so important. God has a message for us. Yes. The book is full of them. Yes. Yes. And God tells us what to do. And the book is full of them. Now, let me make a suggestion. If you're going through a tough time, may I suggest, as I have done before, read the book of Psalms. Many years ago, I heard somebody say that every possible experience you can have, the psalmist had it. So as I preached through the psalms, I noticed that virtually in every case, there are a couple of exceptions, the psalmist is talking about something going on in his life. It could be, I'm facing death. It could be, they're slandering me. It could be, they're plotting against me. That covers a lot of David's psalms. Now, there are one or two where the psalmist is simply surveying the Old Testament. There are three of those. And there are psalms like Psalm 1 that simply says you want to be happy. So it's, 
not coming out of a specific situation, but a situation is involved. So as I went through the Psalms preaching, I entitled each one, When. When this happens, read this Psalm. When this happens, when this happens, when this happens. So if you're going through a situation, read the Psalms. If you don't know what to do, read the Psalms. Matter of fact, a number of years ago, I was going through a situation, didn't know what to do, remembered what I'd heard, and I decided to read the Psalms until I found it. Now, there are 150 of those things, and fortunately, I didn't have to read very far before I found it. So God has a message for you. Trouble is coming, and God has a message for you to how to handle it. It's in His Word. Now, there's a second story in this chapter, and that has to do with the king. Look at verse 9. Then Elisha went to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, was sick. And it was told him, saying, the man of God has come here. Now, this is an unusual verse. In the first place, he goes to Damascus. Damascus is the capital of Syria, which is the enemy of Israel at this time. So why he goes to Damascus is not told to us. I'm not sure why he did it. At any rate, he's there. And the king is, was sick. We don't know what the sickness was, but apparently it wasn't terminal, as the rest of the story seems to indicate. But he was sick. And the text tells us in verse 7, he was told that the man of God was here. Now, Elisha healed that woman's son, but that was in Israel. How would the king of Syria know about Elisha and his ability? Well, if you will remember, there was a military captain in Syria named Naam, who had leprosy, and he had conquered uh, some Israelites and taken one of the little girls and became his maid, and she said to him, you know, there's a prophet in Israel that could help you. And you know the story, he ends up being healed of leprosy. Well, that made the people in Assyria aware of the power of Elisha. So when the text tells us that the king of Syria heard that Elisha was in town, he knew what that meant. He was aware of the fact that Elisha could heal. So we're told in verse 8, and the king said to Azel, take a present in your hand and go to meet the man of God and inquire of the Lord by him saying, shall I recover from this disease? Well, that's an interesting question. If you were sick and you knew there was a healer, that could come heal you, what would your question be? Would you be so kind? That isn't what he asked. He doesn't ask to be healed. He asks whether or not he's going to recover. Interesting. Uh, so we have these uh, two men, the king of Syria and his servant. And by the way, uh, both of those men we have found in a secular inscription that's in the British Museum. Isn't that interesting? That we can document outside this story the historicity of those two individuals. I just thought that was interesting. Matter of fact, uh, you've heard me say this before as we've been going through Second Kings. Uh, we have a number of uh, archaeological demonstrations of the, of the accuracy of the historicity of the Old Testament, especially during this period of time, and even some before this time, and certainly afterward. At any rate, back to the story. The servant went to uh, see Elisha, 
And verse 9 says, he took every good thing of Damascus and 40 camel loads, and he came and stood before him, that is Elisha, and said, shall I recover from this, uh, no, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, sent me to you saying, shall I recover from this disease? Now, what I want you to notice is that he took every good thing of Damascus on 40 camels. Now, it was customary in the Near East at this time to take gifts, and some have suggested that they put one gift per camel for show when you saw 40 camels coming. So, I mean, any way you cut this, if they were totally loaded or one at a time, that's a lot. Now, what did he take them? Well, the text says every good thing of Damascus. And some have suggested that that was thing like, things like uh, their produce, their wine, uh, their fish and fowl, their food. Uh, others have said, well, no doubt silver and gold and raiment. Remember when the king sent Nahum back to the king of Israel and they sent uh, gold, silver, and clothes and we calculated it was in the millions of dollars? Well, you can believe the king has sent him a lot of stuff worth a lot of money. As a matter of fact, there's a Jewish tradition that says that um, there was a precious stone in this worth all the good things in Damascus. So, no doubt, he sent him a lot of money just to know if he was going to recover. Not to ask him to heal him, just to, am I going to recover? The other interesting thing about that verse is he said, your son. Now, obviously, uh, the king is not the son of Elisha, but he addressed him as your son. So what does that mean? Well, that's an, an expression uh, of respect, perhaps, maybe even of humility. At any rate, uh, he sent him a lot of gifts. So Elisha said to him, go and say to him, that is the king, you shall surely recover. That's what made me say a minute ago, this was not terminal, uh, because he says, you're going to recover from it. You don't have to worry. That was your question. You're going to recover. God has a message for you, king. You're going to recover. But there's more. However, the Lord has shown me that he will die. Well, interesting. You got a problem. You're sick. That's going to pass but you're going to die. Now, may I suggest that was for Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, but it's, it was to him, but it's for us. You are going to die. How would you like to go to church and hear the pastor tell you you're going to die, right? I mean, you know that, right? Matter of fact, the scripture says, uh, it is appointed for men to die once, and after that, the judgment. So we all know you're going to die. Now, I think the older you are, the more aware you are that that's going to happen. And the younger you are, the more that message doesn't sort of have a ring of truth about it. Matter of fact, there was a fellow who a number of years ago... Uh, in an interview with the Associated Press, uh, said, quote, everybody has got to die, but I've always believed an exception would be made in my case. <laughs> That's what a lot of people think. Now, I have to tell you, there are two things that are certain. You know them. Death and taxes. Thank you. So God has a message for you. You are going to die. Now, in this second story, nothing else is said. In the first story, 
God had a message, trouble is coming, and God had a second message, do what I tell you in that situation. In this one, God has a message for the king, you're going to die, and there's no second part to the message, now do what I tell you. But since this applies to us, and since there are other passages of scripture, I'm going to talk about, you're going to die, I'm going to die. And the scripture tells us what to do about that. You need to know what the scripture says. As a matter of fact, I read a minute ago a verse from Hebrews that said, it is appointed in a man once to die. The next verse says, so Christ has offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation, Hebrews 9, 28. So the verse 27 says, we're all going to die. Verse 28 says, Christ died for us. One of my favorite verses on this subject is Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All we like sheep have gone astray. It's our nature. Like sheep, it's our nature. We've turned each one to our own way. It's not only our nature, it's our choice. We've gone our way and not God's way. And that is called sin. Now, what you need to know is the wages of sin is death. But Christ took our sin. And if we trust in him to get to heaven, we get his righteousness. One of my favorite illustrations of that, I haven't used it in a long time, wasn't planning on doing it until just now, uh, is this. Uh, this uh, iPhone represents sin. And this handkerchief represents righteousness. The Bible says, he who knew no sin, Christ, became sin. Let me take this phone and lay it on top of the handkerchief. Christ became sin. Christ took your sin. Christ died for your sin. The rest of that verse in 2 Corinthians says that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When you trust Christ, God gives you Christ's righteousness. Now that's God's message to you for dealing with death. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned each one to his own way. And Christ, God has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And when you trust Christ, you stand as righteous before God. That is an incredible message. Are you prepared? God has a message for you. You're going to die. Are you prepared? What are you going to do to get prepared? You see, what's interesting in this passage is the guy got sick. Now, let me tell you, sometimes when you get sick, you immediately think it's terminal. You ever done that? Yeah. Well, you may get over that, but you're going to die, and you've got to deal with that. One of my all-time favorite Bible teachers that I cut my teeth on as a young Christian was a fellow named M.R. DeHaan. He was a medical doctor who became a pastor and a great Bible teacher. He had the best illustrations of any preacher I've ever heard. He once wrote, I'm often asked by doctors, aren't you uh, sometimes sorry you left the practice of medicine and healing of human bodies left the noble profession to become a despised preacher. Dahan said, my answer is always no. All the patients I used to treat died sooner or later. But the people who take the medicine I now offer them, the gospel, never die. The cure is permanent. It gives them eternal life. The gospel is God's panacea. End of quote. Now here's the story, real simple. We're sinners, Christ died, 
And all you have to do is trust Christ to get you to heaven. And God says, I'll give you the gift of eternal life. Romans 6.23, the gift of God is eternal life. Have you trusted Christ? Do you know for sure you're going to heaven? God has a message for you. You're going to die. God has a message for you. You can live forever. And I was poking around this subject this week, and I ran across a story where somebody uh, said that um, they were going to die, and they were going to take their credit cards with them. (laughs) They aren't going to do you any good. They're not going to be able to buy you out of this one. And then the article went on to say that somebody wrote in and said, well, what I need is a good map because I get lost everywhere I go. (laughs) Map isn't going to do you any good. Someone else said, I'm going to need a crowbar in case they buried me prematurely and I can get my way out. Another said, I'm going to need earplugs in case the music in heaven is too loud. And then some wise idiot said, what I'm going to need is a fire extinguisher. Now, let me tell you what you need. One word, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God has a message for you. You're going to die. But God has a message for you. You can live forever if you have Jesus, period. You don't need earplugs. You don't need a crowbar. You don't need a credit card. You need Jesus, period. There's one more story in this passage. The first is God had a message for this lady, unnamed lady, Uh, Trouble's coming. God had a message for a second fella, a king, that he was going to get over his sickness, but he was going to die. But there's a third message here. Remember the king sent a servant to see Elisha? Well, keep reading. Uh, After Elisha gave the servant the message for the king, then it tells us in verse 11, then Elisha set his countenance and he stared at the servant. And then he began to weep. And the servant said, why are you weeping? And he answered, I know the evil that you will do to the children of Israel. Their strongholds you will set on fire, their young men you will kill with the sword, and you will dash their children and rip open their women with child. Whoa, what a message. He's saying, yeah, I have a message for you. You are going to sin. What a message. Now, the Bible is very clear about that. You see, even if you trust Christ, now in this case, I think the man was an unbeliever, and sure enough, we know that he went on and did all those things Elisha said. But since I've talked about being an unbeliever, let me talk about being a believer. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are going to sin. I'm not encouraging you to do it. I'm just telling you the Bible says you're going to do it. That's God's message to you. Matter of fact, uh, let me uh, quote some verses that say that. Uh, The Bible says uh, in James chapter 3, For we all stumble in many things. If we say that we have no sin... Uh, 1 John 1, 8 says, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. James says, we all stumble in many things. And John says, uh, yeah, and if, you, and if you say you don't sin, well, you've deceived yourself and 
Truth is not in you. That's verse 8. Verse 10 says, if we say that we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Whoa. You are going to sin. Now, the rest of this passage says, uh, he reacted to that. Verse 11, he says, what do you mean? Calling me a dog that I would do such gross things? And Elisha answered, the Lord has shown me that you will become king over Syria. And he departed, and he went and said to his master, the king, the king said, well, uh, what did Elijah say to you? And he answered, he told me that you would recover. Did, did Elisha say that? Oh, yeah. What else did he say? You're going to recover and you're going to die. Uh, didn't tell him that. And then he said, and you're going to do wicked things. Didn't tell him that. He deceived the king. He didn't tell the king the truth. Then we're told in verse 15, it happened the next day that he took a thick cloth, dipped it in water, spread it over the face of the king so that he died and the servant reigned in his place. He suffocated the king so that it looked like he died of natural causes. But he committed all those evil things that Elijah predicted of him. Now, just survey the chapter. Isn't it interesting? God had a message for an unknown named woman. God had a message for a king, Ben-Hadad. And he, God had a message for the servant. And so it's natural for me to say the point of this chapter is God has a message for you. There's trouble ahead. You're going to die and you're going to sin. How's that? Now, in the first case, he told the woman, now, if you do what I tell you, you'll be fine. That second part of the message doesn't occur in the next two but the scripture does tell us what to do about death. And the scripture does tell us what to do about sin. Now, I'm going to talk about this for a second. If you're a believer and you sin, then what? Well, I quoted a minute ago from 1 John chapter 1 that says, if you say you don't have sin, you're deceiving yourself and you're making God a liar. So obviously we're sinners even though we're saved. But I want to read the first part of that chapter, that first part of that paragraph. Look at 1 John chapter 1, beginning at verse 5. This is the message which we've heard of him and declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with the other, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. That's 5 to 8. Verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now I read verses 1 to 7. And then skipping to verse 9, it says, If we confess, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I want to say two things. Number one, it, the, the message first is you're going to sin. The solution to that is to acknowledge it. The Greek word translated confess is homo legeo, and it's a compound word. Homo means same, legeo means speak. It's to say the same thing God says. So we say, well, I stretched the truth. God said it was sin. Well, it was a little white. No, God said it was sin. Well, it was, I'm justified. No, God said it was sin. Confession is saying, I see what God said in his word, and I acknowledge it. Now, the reason I read the whole passage is this. It doesn't start with confession. It starts with God is light. And if you walk in the light, we have fellowship. Then it brings up the issue of sin. So if you follow the thought of the passage, the flow of the passage, it becomes obvious that 
It is as we walk in the light of who God is that we begin to see our sin. And then is when we confess it. So one of the messages of God's word is you need to walk in the light of who God is. The psalmist says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. You walk in the light of who God is and what he says in his word. And the more you do that, the more you see your sin. And then the solution to that is confess it. So God has a message for us. We will sin, but God has a message for us. There's cleansing by confession. Now, let me go one step further. The Bible also says you don't have to sin. That it's possible to have victory over sin. There is no temptation or testing that is com- but has happened to you, but is common to man. And God is faithful who will give you a way of escape. And the next verse says flee. In that case, immorality. So God can give you the power to overcome the sin, but that is only through his word and the work of the Holy Spirit. It is only as you understand what he says in his word and as you depend upon the spirit of God to give you the power to do what the word says. Let me repeat. This is one of the most important things I'm going to say today and for that matter forever. If you've once trusted Christ, then the scripture tells you what to do and the Holy Spirit gives you the power to do it. So Hebrews 4 says, come boldly to the throne of grace that you might find mercy and grace to help in time of need. So the message God has for all of us is we're going to sin, but we don't have to. God can give us the power to not sin. How are we doing? You got it? God has a message for you. Depends on who you are. It depends on where you are in your life. Depends on what's going on in your life. But God has a message for you. Is it that you're in trouble? Is it that uh, you're facing death? That applies to all of us. Or is it that you're grappling with sin? That's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. But beyond all of that, the message God has for you is the solution is in his word. If there's anything I want to say today, based on this passage, is God has a message for us about trouble and death and sin and all that stuff. But beyond that, in the first case, he said, now do what I tell you to do. The solution is in the word of God. I want to talk about that for a second. I've spent my life studying the book. Gone through virtually all of them. And I've come to a conclusion. Do you know where to go if you have a problem? I'm up here saying, you got to go to the Word. Do you know where to go? Well, let me make a suggestion. If you would like to know how to handle trouble and trials, read the book of James. The subject of James is trials. If you're going through a trial, read that book once a day, straight through without stopping for seven days and maybe 30. On the other hand, if you would like to get on solid biblical teaching concerning how to walk with the Lord, I would highly recommend the book of Ephesians. If you want to get on solid ground concerning the doctrine of salvation, justification by faith, get into Galatians. You want to know how to handle all the complex issues that come up in life? I mentioned this a minute ago. Read Psalms. You want to have wisdom? You want to be smart spiritually instead of stupid? 
read the book of Proverbs. And I've given you five books. In my opinion, after spending my life studying this book, if you knew those five books, you would be way down the road if you practice what they say to becoming a spiritually mature Christian. You want me to repeat them? Trials, James. The spiritual life, Ephesians. The doctrine of salvation, Galatians. All the problems in life, Psalms and wisdom, Proverbs. God has a message for you. That whatever you are facing is in his word. May I repeat that? That's the point I want to make today. Whatever you are facing is in his word. Wow. What other book could you recommend that will do that? There aren't many. There aren't many. What a book. What a book. A traveler was once packing his suitcase, and he remarked to a friend, Well, I still wish to pack a guidebook, a lamp, a mirror, a telescope, a book of poetry, a number of bibliographies, a bundle of letters, and a hymn book, a sharp sword, a small library containing 66 volumes. The friend interrupted said, You've only got six inches left in the side of the suitcase. How are you going to manage to pack all of that? And he smiled and said, real easy, I'm going to put my Bible there. <laughs> or someone else has said, the Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, the happiness of believers. It was the light to direct us, the food to support us, comfort to cheer us. It's the traveler's map, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Christ is the grand subject, and the glory of God is the end. It is a mind of wealth, a parade of glory, and a river of pleasure. Get in this book. It has the answers to life. Amen. Crossing a muddy road on a dark night many years ago, a Sunday school teacher neglected to follow the lamp held by one of the students. As a consequence, he slipped and landed in a puddle. Ah, said the teacher self-accusingly. That's what I get for not walking where I can see. What's the use of the light if your footsteps are not directed by it? Years later, the student remarked, I never forgot those words. How now as I behold the light of God's truth, I am reminded that it too will be of little value to me unless I follow it. You see, the mud puddles of life are troubles, Trials, temptation, and death. So you can wallow in the mud or walk in the light. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us your word as a light, as a lamp, and giving us your spirit as a power and as a strength so that we can do what you said in your word. Lord, thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.